Today's conversation is with Dr. Guillaume Latoum. Guillaume is an ecological modeler, mathematical ecologist, and lecturer in the environmental change biology in the Institute of Evolutionary Biology at the University of Edinburgh. Guillaume's research especially consists of modeling ecological communities in the context of biological invasions, from the point of view of complexity sciences, understanding how different patterns emerge from community assembly processes. It was very interesting to hear about Dr. Latoum's pathway through his scientific career, as well as his international collaborations and travels. During our conversation, he mentioned many concepts, some of which were fairly new to us, such as the imposter syndrome in science, all of which are very much real, but remain hidden behind the curtains of academia at times. We thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and we hope that you do too. And here is our conversation with Guillaume Latoum. Yeah, so we'd like to start off just by having you tell us about your career. It's like, what do you enjoy about being a scientist? What are some moments that have like really stood out for you? you know, what do you enjoy about being a scientist? Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess for to answer that, I need to I need to go back to to the to the start because like my career trajectory was quite uncommon, I think. So after high school, I was basically good at science, math, physics, especially. So I did. I was uh, so I did my high my high school and my, my curriculum in France, and I did an engineering school in France in electricity. So no, sorry. First, so before my engineering school, yeah, I did a preparatory what's called a preparatory class, which is this in very intensive two to three years uh, period when you just work a lot, a lot, a lot until you get some tests to and uh, some selection to go to different engineering classes in the uh, engineering schools. So I went to an engineering school in uh, in electricity in Grenoble, so in the, the at the foot of the of the French Alps, and realized I did not really enjoy it that much, you know. Like I mean, I wasn't passionate about it. So and from for the last year, my third year, I went to Canada to Montreal for an exchange program, and then I realized basically I knew I I mean being an engineer working in a company was not for me, like. I liked something, you know, like some motivation in the morning. I couldn't see myself in a job where the main motivation is to make a company work. And so to make like stakeholders, shareholders or whatever richer, you know, like, I mean, I needed sort of, sort of something more, you did like, I don't know, like a, like utopian or something, I guess. So I basically during the end, I was also looking for a field I would enjoy more. So I did a few different things, like because when you were where when we were traveling, we could actually we had a bit more leeway in the like in the the courses we we were allowed to take, and so I did I did a course in um, uh, artificial neural networks and machine machine learning basically, uh, which worked quite well. I had a pretty good grade, and so but and the the teacher told me like, oh look, the, there is this new colleague who just arrived, looking for an uh, MSc student. You have the math, the math, the medical skills to do it. Do you want to do a master's with, uh, with him? And like, yeah, actually, that sounds great. So I did this master's in machine learning, and I was working for the Canadian defense. They were funding these, uh, these masters. And so it was super interesting technically. So long story short, the idea was to use uh, something called stochastic grammars uh to uh so that's originally from linguistic but you uh, so you have like a, a, stru- a grammatical structure to decode to understand the sort of hidden structure behind a sequence of words and that was used to decode some radar signals so radars like have words and like depending on which motive they are like i mean at the time it, they were quite new and uh, if you are searching acquiring looking on the on target you know you will have like different signals and uh, you need like your ship or plane to be able to uh, to tell you that something's bad's going to happen. So and after so after that, still not satisfied. Working for the DA for the for the army, I mean, was not also something I was seeing myself do. So I decided to go to to try to find something that would still relate to what I knew. So I, I'm on, I looked into cognitive science a little bit, and uh, which is a mix of psychology, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning neuroscience, all this kind of thing. Uh, okay, that sounds very interesting. Let's, uh, let's do it. So, and I found a master's in Barcelona in primatology that was looking at primate cognition. 
So I went there for a year. And in the end, realized like that. So I could go, I had my pass to go see animals to the zoo every day for free. I spent a lot of time there looking at them, drawing them. Like at some point, even like one of the female chimpanzee would recognize me, always come and kiss me through the glass. That was actually quite cool. And uh, especially, especially on Sundays when you have all the tourists around and you arrive and you feel like, uh, like I have long hair. So I feel like, like they were like, oh, Tarzan is in the place. Huh? That was quite fun. Actually, also, there was a conference this year and Jen Goodall was there. And so we were able, like, uh, I went to this conference with all the other master's students and we met Jen Goodall, which was quite a crazy experience. Real lady. She was, like, on a tight schedule. Uh, like, the, the guy in Chile, they were launching the Jen Goodall Institute in Spain. The guy who, uh, who was helping her was like, oh, no, don't bother her. We have a schedule. And she said, like, something like, yeah, well, we're going to make place, but uh, like space in the schedule because these are the young generation. They are the one who can change things. So we're going to take some time for them. I was like, okay, real lady. Uh, so that was quite, that was actually quite cool. So, but yeah, so uh, after that, I realized, you know, like it's interesting to know. So you can run like a lot of like cognitive tests for, uh, for primates or animals in general. So one famous one is the hidden uh, spot. So you, uh, you basically put a spot on their forehead so that, but without them realizing it, knowing it, and then you show a mirror and you look at if they're going and scratch and look at the spot to see if they recognize, basically if they can understand in their mind that they're seeing themselves in the mirror. So you have all these kind of things. And, but again, like they're all like dying in the wild. And I was like, okay, what, it's good to know like what the cognitive abilities are, but there are almost no more apes and a lot of species are endangered so what's the point you know like I mean and so that's why I went back to Montreal to do my PhD in ecological modeling so mixing what I knew in uh, like in computer science during this uh, master's in primatology we were introduced to a kind of modeling called uh, individual based model models or individual based modeling when you basically it's more like a bottom up so you uh, you model each individual separately with simple rules and you look at what happens when you put everyone together in a certain environment and then you have some emergence. And for me, that was mind blowing, this way of thinking about a model, you know, very different from the top down approach that you get in, in um, machine learning when you have like one big equation that uh, to classify something, for example. And so that's why I went back to Montreal from the PhD and I, when I said, uh, so in modeling animal movements for caribou, moose and wolves, in the boreal forest and see how they will, their movement will change based on forestry activities and their interactions. And this, uh, so basically the idea is that when you modify the forest, you were like, uh, you, cut, you cut the forest of many deciduous trees, it's good for the moose, it's good for the wolves, means, meaning it's bad for the caribou. And from there on, and from, from there on, I was like, yeah, okay, that's something I know I wanna do, like working in this field is what really motivates me. It has the technical challenge I'm looking for, like the mind frame in terms of math, programming, thinking in terms of models. It's a bit like doing a SimCity game for animals and plants, which is also quite cool. I like, I mean, I like video games, so I guess I, <laughs> I like that. And you can explore, but you can apply that to something that really matters. And uh, like, I mean, at least to me, you know, like it's, uh, you have like some sort of connection with the, like, yeah, with the natural world. And so that's when I knew, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Like my the PhD was quite long, you know, it was North American. So far it took me five years and it wasn't always easy, but every morning I would wake up, you know, know that what I was doing was the right thing. So I guess, yeah. Okay. That was a long answer for your question, but <laughs> I'd just like to, uh, to show a bit like that, like, It's it was it was really a process for me, you know. It was not like from the start I know what I want to do. For me, from the start, I had no idea what I want to do. I knew I knew what I was good at, but I lacked really the um, yeah this motivation, this sense of I know why I'm doing that, and it came along the experience, my the, the successive experiences basically. So yeah, I guess that's it. Right, and you know during all that you you mentioned lots of different places france then montreal then barcelona so it feels like you've studied quite a lot abroad so how common is this for scientists you think and what impact 
does it have for you personally? And what do you think? Is it necessary? Should people do? Do you recommend people doing? <clears throat> yes, so uh, that's good. So, I mean, you have sometimes you won't really get a choice. I mean, it depends also where you come from, which country you come from. You know, if it's a country like, I mean, there are a lot of biases in science towards Western countries. And uh, like, I would include Australia in that, you know, like, uh, because uh, based on the history, but um, because you have like just a higher density of uh, of universities, better funded, and so on. And so, of course, if you're in one of these countries, you can stay in your in the say in the same country. You'd say it's possible. You have like a large choice, and um, yeah, and I would. And definitely you want to switch universities at some point, develop a network of collaborators and so on. Then it's of course, but it's always good to go and travel and see other countries, you know? So after my PhD in Montreal, I did a postdoc for four years in Australia and Melbourne. Uh, so at Monash University. Then I did uh, one and a half year in South Africa at Stellenbosch University. So it's next to Cape Town. I did one and a half year in Vienna, Austria. And finally, I got this position here in Edinburgh. And it's, it is a very competitive environment, like in the sense, like, I mean, competitive in the sense, like, you know, like you, you don't have a competitive mindset, but there are a lot of, of PhD students and postdocs compared to the uh, number of available positions. So having the flexibility to travel will basically help you find like a, like a, find, find a position. And um, so, yeah, it's, Traveling is good because you, yeah, you meet the interesting people, you see different research cultures and uh, you see, and from a personal perspective, you know, it's just very enriching. Like you see like a, a different, not just re a different research culture, but different culture um, altogether. So really good. I probably did a bit too much and I didn't have, uh, because I didn't really have a, a clear plan when I, uh, and I just went a bit with the flow and um, it's not always easy moving moving around that much because you have to start a new like new friendships all the time and so on. But it's very enriching, you know. It's always like I mean, it's like life in general, you know. You you will have trade offs all the time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I would really encourage people to do it. It's good. Like living. Also, I remember when I was in Montreal, I realized like everyone who can do it should go live for one year abroad. And then it would solve, I think, a lot of issues and uh, perspectives of people that people have on the world, you know, like, because suddenly, like, you're the stranger, you're the, you're the immigrants uh, in, in a country, and nothing is as you are used to, and you have to adapt. At the same time, you try to still keep a bit your culture, so, you know, like, people say, like, it would probably solve like, uh, like, yeah, open people's mind a bit more. Uh, that would be good. But it's also a privilege, you know, because it costs money. And um, not everyone, and uh, if you have responsibilities, it's a bit, uh, it's not always possible. But um, yeah, so long story short, yes, travel if you can. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good idea overall. Um, a bit on a tangent, um, How tell us about your experience in Australia, because, you know, we're here as well. And yeah. Any, any uh, memorable experiences um, about Monash University, maybe in Melbourne? It was, it was great. I mean, memorable experiences. Yeah. What can I say? I don't know. It's a bit. It's a beautiful country. You know, like uh, I loved it. Um, I remember. Yeah. I mean, let me think about. Uh, sorry, I I think a bit about that. You know, I had a I had a great time in Australia. Sometimes a harder time understanding everyone. Like, but story of my life because I travel. I'm not a native speaker, and so many different accents. I live in Scotland now, so it's uh, so I also had a, bit of, <laughs> a few little like moments like that. Um, no, I would get and uh, yeah, something that something I was that was like I mean memorable was we had the first year we had a conference in Alice Springs, and so so we went to visit uh, Uluru the uh, the weekend before. Because otherwise you bear you you often don't uh, have the opportunity to do it. And then went to this conference and in Mel and I know I mean Australia has a difficult history with uh, Aborigines and in Melbourne there it's mostly it's like it's mostly I mean it's quite international but you don't yeah there there aren't really Aborigines you you almost don't see any 
and in Alice Springs, it was a bit, um, yeah, like sho- like shocking, like to to see that and like kind of cast away. Sometimes you know, like having to show your like, your um, uh, your ID to buy alcohol, this kind of thing that really made me realize this side of Australia. You have very different sides in Australia. Basically, it's a very good side and this side also uh, on the side. So that's uh that would be i mean that okay so that's a personal experience and that's not to, and that's not to criticize australia, australia you know <laughs> like it's uh yeah. like that i had a great time in the in this country and it's a wonderful country every country has a chip on their shoulder uh it's just something that i remember but that's more personal like research wise it's uh i don't know it's quite like a, yeah it's a it's, how can i say how can i say that i don't know it was an interesting experience. Was found it a bit more competitive than in some other places I've been to in terms of in terms of research. Um, I'm not sure why. Maybe so. In, maybe because the country is very big, but and the cities are quite far from each other, and so and you don't have that many universities, although you have very good level universities. Um, it was a little. I found like yeah a little bit more competitive research wise compared to other universities I've been to. Uh, but also it's a, it's also a country that really values, like, I mean, value science in many ways, like, and uh, as a postdoc, certainly like after a PhD student, you don't get a lot of money, you know, like uh, you, and suddenly you you have a very decent salary, a very good facilities to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to do your research. So then you're just like, wow, the society values what I do. This is amazing. I love this feeling. <laughs> and uh, which is some, so like often something that is missing a bit at the PhD level. And that would be a criticism of academia in general. You know, like it's, um, it can be a bit tough and uh, not always acknowledging enough all the efforts that people go, like, uh, go through, especially, especially at the PhD le- level, I would say. And so, yeah, becoming like, like being a postdoc in Australia for that was actually pretty nice. Which countries do you think value it the most? Based on personal experience or also just from what you know from others? So sorry, which country? Which, which countries value science the most, do you think? Um, I mean, some, it's hard to tell. Like it's, I think like countries, you know, have, it depends on what you use as a reference to say, like to assess the value, you know, like they, they, you, you give to science. So, so for example, yeah. So Australia has a model that functions well in terms of money, but it's also more competitive, you know, like you go to other countries, you go to Austria and it's much more pub- like the, like public funded, for example. So, which I find somehow, you know, like maybe, so maybe that means, the society values it more because it comes directly from you know from like uh, from public funds rather than having to get the students and everything but it's maybe that also reflects my own like system of thought of thoughts over, overall um yeah it's um it's it's hard to tell it's, i think it's very different models of science you know like uh, of reader of mm-hmm. research and so, and I'm sure, and so and I think the people who are in charge often values the uh, values, think they they are I mean or value science they just have a different way of expressing it. Uh, mm-hmm. When I and of course obviously you know when I was in South Africa that's a country with is it's all on set of challenges that uh, that the other countries I've been to like don't have. So sometimes it might be hard also to tell apart you know what is the value you give to science versus like taking a bit, like uh, taking into account the context, which uh, mm-hmm. and disentangling the two can uh, can be actually a bit hard. Mm-hmm. So uh, I uh, I wouldn't have like a very clear answer <laughs> to this uh, to uh, to this question. Mm-hmm. It's just like yeah, very different. It's also very it's really gonna going to differ from one university to another. You know the research environments, even from one department to another, or one school to another. So. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell exactly, you know, like uh, like this kind of thing. But um, yeah, I mean, I had a good yeah, Australia, like I said, 
It's, a, it's comfortable, very comfortable as a researcher. Austria was also very, really nice. A lot of advantages. I mean, just like you, you have like, you feel you have a decent life, you know, so it's not just doing well, doing what you love shouldn't always be a struggle to be validated. Like if you get a good, uh, like all the, the whole package, you know, it's, uh, it's better. So yeah, now um, UK is great too. I'm having a really great time here. Like you know, I've been here for a bit more than a year now. And so far it's, it's, it's been great. But uh, although, uh, yeah, yeah, no, might be some issue, but I mean, it's also hard. Like I haven't been here for a long time and during the pandemic, so I, I don't get the whole perspective, like a global perspective yet. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned this already, um, that you studied, you started with your engineering and your master's with AI. And I yeah. am personally very interested. And we actually, all three of us have deep interest in computer science. Um, what led you to, first? What what led you to shift to biology, and how was that experience in general? And also, how does it feel to com combine computer science with a science degree? Because that seems to be the prospect of the academia now a lot. Yeah. So, like I said, for me, the switch was really I need to find to apply what I knew to a to a field that I thought was important. You know, reflected my values. Yeah and uh connection okay, like a connection with your with the environment is part uh, of my uh, of my values you know like you know, the thing doesn't mean i you know i spend all my weekends in nature or everything but i really feel like we should like you know we should consider more yeah our, our natural world and the relationship we have with the with the uh, with the natural world which is often taken very in a very utilitarian fashion um rather than you know like relational relational fa fa fashion um in practice so yeah in terms of applying it's 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 i i think i mean it goes well you know like um especially now like we are in the era of big data and that applies also to biology ecology and natural science. And so having the skills to actually do that, I think is very useful. And we are still, um, I can see like when I'm advertising projects to try to find PhD students, you know, it's not that common. And the, the bridges between the fields are not, are not that common. And th so there are a lot of opportunities. And I think if you come with a good like computer science degree and also computer science skills to a natural to a to natural science that's that is definitely very valuable uh yeah some, sometimes it's a and then it's weird like you must accept that you will feel you might feel a bit dumb sometimes because you don't have the whole training that other people have you know like uh, in my department you know when they talk about genetics and stuff some uh, like Sometimes it just like goes over my head. I, I admit that because I was trained as an engineer. I switched to ecology for my PhD, and ecology works well because it's a very logical field. But like genetics, for example, which and often you have like biology, ecology, like studied together, and I didn't have this training and a lot of terms, sometimes complicated. I don't really necessarily get. But on the other side, you know, it's uh, it's cool. Like I mean, I also have a set of skills and knowledge that they don't have. So it's uh, so 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 that's that's perfectly fine. It's more sometimes about communicating things that can where that can be a bit more challenging because you need to adapt to the way other people think because of the way they were taught and reciprocally. You know, like they need to. You also need to be able to convey things in a way of thinking that might be different from when the majority of people around you uh, are used to. But more like it's more and more today, like it becomes like the connections, even though I said like they are still missing, is they're becoming more and more common though. So this is becoming easier and easier, definitely. Sure. Uh, in, a, in a separate uh, sort of space of questions, I wanna, we wanna ask you like, what do you consider a scientist to be? It's like what attributes or what qualities do you think they possess across the board? So, I mean, I'll speak from an academic perspective, right? Because sure. as a scientist, you know, you can work 
I mean, yeah, like uh, for, for companies, you can work from for Google, you can work for a pharmaceutical company, and the objective is quite different from the objective you will have in academia. You know, mm-hmm. like in, uh, in industry, we'll be more, more profit-oriented in academia, kind of work for the sake of knowledge, ideally. Uh, so I would say the set of quality you should have is... Um, yeah, open-mindedness, creativity, uh, humility, because you will get your work criticized and it's sometimes hard not to take it personally because you invested a lot of time in all that, like in this work. And it's perfectly normal to be criticized in science. That's how it advances, you know, like you make mistakes. Some people, that's the whole idea behind like the peer review, for example, you know, like where when you publish a paper, you have your, you made, you made your experiments, your simulations, whatever. You wrote the paper with your results, like conclusions, discussions, submit it somewhere to, a, to, like a, to a scientific journal. It gets sent to a, send like two or like typically two reviewers who will read it and critically assess it. And then you get these comments. And sometimes comments are nice. Sometimes they're not so nice. And yeah, it's uh, and sometimes you know, like it's easy to go like, ah, oh, they don't get it, blah blah blah. But uh, it's uh, because yeah, you spend like so much time on that, you know, and people will criticize what you've done, what you've done. So you need to be humble and understand. Okay, it means I need to maybe I made a mistake. Did I make a mistake? Like, did they actually are they what are did they find a mistake? So yes, then you fix it and you move on. No, then that means I probably need to explain better what I did to avoid any misunderstanding. You know, so it's a, you need like to be humble and you need like a good sense of ethics, of ethics also, I'd say, you know, you've had like stories of people forging data and stuff like that, having to retract papers because of that. Or even like just the way you are, like I was mentioning, you know, like uh, PhD students and uh, like sometimes they're not valued enough and that comes a lot from like per people with like like for, for, from uh, yeah, from PIs like personal um, principal investigators, like lecturer, readers, professors in general, to uh, to value like students as like really as people and such you know so and sometimes it's you, can, you have also stories of people being terrible uh, like advisors and uh, and that, that's not good for the field. So yeah, so what did I say? Open-mindedness, creativity, humility, and ethics, I would say. You know, mm-hmm. apart from, I mean, the smarter you are, if you are smart, it helps a bit too, I guess. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. But I would say these four are probably the more the most important ones for me. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and continuing on that uh, whole prospect, uh, idea of what makes a scientist, what, what do you think are some key steps that you recommend? Uh, we should take and the steps that we should establish to have a successful and perhaps fruitful career in science. Yeah. So, thoughts on that. so again, so speaking like, I mean, first steps are going to be like for both, I get the private and sector or, or and academia. But um, so first you need to define, you know, when you say it's like fruitful and successful, what is it, what is fruitful and successful for you? <coughs> So it can be, you know, like if you want to make like if you want, if you for you being successful is making money, you know, like it's that means you probably like first thing I need a field where I can apply the that can be applied to the private sector in the industry and develop and to to develop things like that, and that can be a, your definition of being successful, you know, like uh, or basically, yeah, you just need to to uh to understand what you want what you are looking for you know um and then once you're that so if you want to like if you want to have fr- like freedom of uh in the sense like uh, of what you want to work on then academia is great for that for example uh and for me that's definitely something i was I, I wanted I wanted to have you know like having a nine to five job working for a company for someone else was not for me so that's why I went to academia now being successful in academia means a few things uh, that would mean writing like writing papers getting grants 
getting a getting a permanent position in a, in a good um, in a good university. So to do that, you you will start, of course, like trying to identify the subjects you want to uh, you want to work on, like the the general field, and it's fine to make mistakes on the along the way. I mean, my trajectory was definitely not straight, um, but and that came from the fact that originally I wasn't sure what I wanted what I wanted to do, and. The earlier you can think about that, you know, what interests you, you know, what motivates you. And I can't remember who said, uh, like, you know, like if uh, if you find what you love, like uh, then you and if, if you work in what you love, then you won't you won't have to work uh, like uh, for a day in your life or something like that, which which is wrong. It's not it's not true. Like even I love what I do and still like it feels like it feels like work. Uh, like you know, some morning to just wake up and just like oh damn, it's like uh, I could stay in bed you know but uh that's normal that's part of it you know like uh, but overall you get what it means that you always, I always get the motivation like this because i know that what i do is in line with my values what i want to do and um that's what that's what's more uh, most important i think and so the earlier you can think about this kind of thing the better uh you know like uh, the, the quicker the, the week quicker you will do you will do it uh, and then it's going to be quite practical, you know, try to find a good university uh, to get a good degree that will be recognized in the like uh, nationally and internationally. But I would also say like try to find an university with a good culture overall, you know, like uh, like to also where you can, I want to say bloom, you know, like but just like develop nice relationships. Like, when you when you will feel like valued as a student, you uh, you will like develop nice relationships, you know, like and uh, so different universities have different have different cultures, you know. So it's I think it's good to to take that into uh, into account. And then it's gonna be get your good degree if you can get a first class honors is really gonna help a lot of universities. So the University of Edinburgh, if you want to do a PhD, it's basically going to be much easier if you get a first class honors than if you are lower you know on the on the ranks uh then do an msc if you can do a phd one or two postdocs and then you apply for permanent positions or for a fellowship <clears throat> and you do it and you get that so as you go along the way you know you will develop like try to go from develop your network of collaborators very important that's how you get your ideas by discussing with people and with people, with interview, with nice people you want to work with. So I have some great collaborators that I made all along the years, uh, like through through my different PhDs and postdoc, PhD and postdocs. And yeah, I wouldn't have these ideas today, like you know, if I had not discussed them with all these people, and I keep on doing it to, uh, today. So. Yeah, the, the, I guess that I guess I guess that would be it. But also, like, don't be a, don't be afraid to make some mistakes. You know, like and sometimes to like realize that it's not exactly what I'm looking for. Reassess yourself. You know, like don't be like too um, stubborn and say like, no, 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 I did that. Like, no, I can't. You know, we have this thing like uh, like in psychology, like this aversion to loss kind of thing. You know, like and like uh, I invested so much. Like it's uh, you know like uh, I don't want to lose that, and but if it makes you someone if it doesn't make you happy in the future then yes you know like and you will always if you if you make some decision in general for good reasons, then you won't regret it you know and you will get something out of it and then it's fine to try to switch of course and then if you want to switch maybe try to do it in a smart way, you know, like uh, if you, if you were doing something and you want to, and you go to something completely different, that might be that. I mean, if it's because really that's what you want to do. Yes. Sometimes it's nice. You know, if you can, like, I like what I did my, for me, what I did was, this is what I know. This is what I'm good at. This is why I want to go. How can I use what I know to get where I, where I want to go rather than starting a biology degree from scratch, you know, for example, and you need a bit of luck along the way, meeting the because like meeting the right people will understand uh, what uh, yeah what you intend to do. But uh, but it's, and it's perfect. It's perfectly fine to uh, yeah make some mistakes and adapt. 
and I'm still like constantly evolving, even uh, even today. You know, in like in what I work on, what I research, which which is great. It's great to hear that. And one thing I found very interesting about that is the whole realistic aspect that even even as scientists who literally love doing what they do every day. You also you still lose motivation at times, you know, and you still need to spend some time, maybe regaining that motivation. Exactly. Yeah. Right. No. Really. Like. I mean, it's. That's. I mean, that's life in general. You know, like it's. Uh, yeah. Like and during the pandemic, like I've seen. Like I mean, I started during the pandemic, so it was a bit, a bit tricky. You know, I had to wake up in the morning, staying in my apartment. I could see in a kind of in a city where I I had just arrived. I knew like three or four people in person. And. The morning I was like, okay, what's the point of what I'm doing? You know, like also, cause like I said, like I couldn't discuss my risk. You <clears throat> that's another thing in research, like in academia, often, you know, like most of the time you don't see concrete output, you know, your output is your scientific results and so on. So how do you give value to that? By getting feedbacks about on it, by uh, having people like, you know, saying, yeah, oh, that's a good idea. And then moving on. And then you can take that to go somewhere else. And yeah, in the pandemic, you, uh, you, uh, we didn't, I didn't have that because I was just by myself in this flat. And at least, and in my department, like the, so I didn't have any teaching at that time, but I see my colleagues invested so much energy into travel, like uh, delivering online teaching to students, taking care of the students, making sure everyone was fine because it, it was very challenging uh, psychologically for them too. And it was exhausting, you know, like, and, uh, but still, you know, you're like, and it was not fun every day for them also, but end of the day, you know, we all do this work because yeah, because deep down there is this big core of this is important and, uh, and this is really what matters, you know, it's not going to be like rainbow and sunshine and fun all the time because, because it's life. It's, uh, I mean, uh, uh, general, that's, that's like that, you know? And sometimes that, and that's what cool in research, like in academia, is that one, especially like once you are like you're lucky to get a permanent position, you can start exploring a bit of other things. You know, like you have this uh, this job security, which is nice, and you start like exploring something a bit different than what you were doing, and then oh, that's super cool. You get super excited about this new thing, and then you go back to what you were doing again before, which was maybe less exciting for some time. And then you get also excited at the moment. And then you're going to meet someone and start talking about, about yeah, something that because you maybe it was not that exciting because you're a bit stuck. You didn't know, you know, you were working on it by yourself. Start worth talking about it with someone, gives you a new perspective. It's like, oh, awesome. So yeah, it's, but yeah, you're definitely going to have a bit of fluctuations. I guess that's... Um, I mean, at least that's for me, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but, um, but yeah, for me, what's important is like the, having this, like, like I said, like this kind of core element of thing that, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing is important and it's cool. And, you know, yeah. And then you will, usually when I go on holidays for more than two weeks after, so, you know, you switch off, you're with family, you go to travel, you do something. And then you start like thinking naturally again about your, your project and having new ideas and seeing things a bit differently. And then whoosh, everything starts again. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's definitely, that's completely normal. I think. That sounds exciting. <laughs> um, and on that note, what, do you, what are some other unpleasant aspects of being a scientist? Do you think that's obviously one of them? What, what else do you think? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I told you about like being criticized often you know like it's uh <clears throat> it's uh i mean that's something you should accept you should learn not to take things personally <clears throat> you have these things uh, you know like i was saying about like feeling dumb when you talk to people and there is this thing which is quite common in academia which is called the imposter syndrome and it's not only you can find it in in different in different environments you know but i know like uh, academia is definitely it's definitely blooming in academia and this imposter syndrome is basically this feeling that you are a fraud, you know, that you actually have no idea what you're doing and uh, that people are going to realize it. And, uh, and it's, never, it's never true. 
I think it's kind of like, do you know the, the Dunning-Kruger effect? Have you heard about that? Uh, the, it's, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's so this Dunning-Kruger, I mean, apparently I've heard recently that it might not be true actually, but I don't, I'm not sure you know, if it's very scientific, like uh, as such, but it's quite, it's quite cool. It's, and it's, uh, you get like experimentally, you kind of see it everywhere. So basically, if you were to draw an axis and uh, let me do it like this for you. Uh, so here you have how much you know about the subject. And here on the Y axis, you have your confidence. And usually it goes like that, down and then up again. So you start, you don't know anything. So you're not confident about it. You learn a little bit about it. And suddenly you're like, oh, this is amazing. And you like, because also this is exciting. And you start like talking about it and feeling like that's, that's, and often, but often explaining, seeing your opinion, maybe a bit too loudly. And they call it mount stupidity and the uh, model of stupidity. And then you have, as you learn more, you realize how little know you, you know actually about things. And then you have the valley of despair or something like that, which is exactly probably kind of where the imposter syndrome uh, like appears, like occurs. And then you start like, as you learn, and then, so, and then you become more and more confident. And I mean, that this amount of stupidity is uh, like, I mean, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect was often advanced, you know, like, it's been like even now during the pandemic, like with all people who like do your research, you know, like saying like, oh, like uh, they've seen like a YouTube like a video and they think they're experts on the subject and so on. And I think there's a little bit, I mean, there's a little bit of truth about, uh, about that. And so in academia, yeah, you end up like, you pass this stage quite quickly. And then like at some point you're like in this valley of despair, you have like, and you have all these very smart people around you, you know? And you often tend to compare yourself to the best element of everyone, you know? This, this person got like more papers than me. Oh, this person, they got this amazing grant. Oh, this person, they got so many students. Oh, this person, they got that, you know? Like they, they, and, but you're not comparing yourself to one person. You're comparing someone like yourself to a fusion of people like uh, who goes and uh, like do it like, and just this like superhero, you know, of, of research. And it's, uh, and so, but, and it can be a bit depressing. And then you realize like, no, actually, like you have your credits too. And people compare themselves to you too sometimes, hopefully. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, but it's, um, it's definitely something that it's nice uh, to talk about, about it with people. And I had this at some points uh, when I started my first postdoc, it's for uh, like often for early career researchers. And yeah, I really, I went through that and I was like, I thought that I was, my boss was going to realize how bad I was at thing. And, uh, and she was going to create to fire me and yeah, it never happened. And we had a very good collaboration, very good collaboration, you know, like, and, and then I learned about it after I was like, oh, wow. Okay. That's very close to home. And I asked uh, to my friends uh, in the office, like, hey, guys, have you ever heard about that? Like, oh, yeah, got it, got it. <laughs> like, yeah, got it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, but it can get to you. Uh, the only thing I would guess, you know, like if we want to go to talk a bit practically is that, you know, financially, it's not as lucrative as, a pri as work in doing science in the private sector, you know. PhD is you don't you get a, like a, some studentship which is not that high, and then you're gonna be a postdoc for a while. I mean, the, you need, and you're often gonna have to do a few postdocs before eventually finding a position. But I think, I think the the ratio like the percentage is like ten percent of people with PhD end up with a job in academia. So it, it's not much. And there are um, there are way more people than there are uh, positions, so that's something that can be a bit tricky, you know. Like, uh, and especially if you have like if you have a family or uh, like and some responsibilities and obligations that make it harder to uh, to travel and to adapt, that can definitely be an issue, you know. Like uh, like when you talk when I talk to other people uh, before, like you know. They always decide where they want to go, and then they try to see what job they can find there. But in academia, it's the job, 
and then you go there. Like, uh, I mean, yeah, unless really you don't want to, to go to that place, but it's often the other the other way around. So this can be a bit uh, a bit challenging too, and it's important, to, uh, yeah, to uh, to uh, to know uh, like to be aware of that, you know, at some point. And it's good to like have some contingency plans if things don't really go the way uh, the way you want to. And again, you know, like it's uh, like I was referring earlier to this um, being fine with making mistakes and failing a bit. I think sometimes, like by failing, I mean not doing what's the plan, like not succeeding. You know, at what the plan was exactly. But that's fine, you know. Like it's uh, you will get something out of it, and you and so and often like it can be a blessing in disguise. So, but but yeah. It's just you need to it's good to be aware of it of the of these challenges in academia yeah and about that imposter syndrome because i found it very interesting i I realize that even we have it at this stage getting to i feel like at any stage in life moving on and at, at when there is just even a little bit of competition you just can start comparing yourself with the other people how did you personally deal with it and how do you think others can deal with it what's a good way of dealing with it talk about it like a lot of things it's about communication and um <clears throat> when you realize other people have it and in that i mean you know you can have like like conditions that are i mean that are real impersonal syndrome is real but i mean it that it's a misconception about like uh, about who you are you know like uh, if you're like the wrong evaluation of yourself <clears throat> So in that case, talking about it with other people, realizing that, okay, first other people have it. And then especially it's, uh, it's something, you know, that it's not, ex- it's actually a misrepresentation of who you are. Then suddenly it gets better. And, you know, like, and you're going to get, no, like people will say, no, look, man, like you amazing at that. Look, I haven't done this, that you did and so on. And then suddenly it's like, oh yeah, actually that's true. You know, like it's, uh, so that would be for me the most, yeah, the best thing to talk about it and realizing, yeah, like, because like I said, we tend to compare ourselves to this kind of superhero, which is a mix of all the good qualities of people without taking any of this, of their faults. And that's not realistic, you know, like, um, so yeah, when you start talking about it, you realize that, and you realize that people, and if you realize people are comparing to themselves to you for some aspects, then so then it's much better. But communicating about it, and um, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes it can be caused also, I guess, by some toxic environments. That was not, I mean, they were, it wasn't from my uh, from my uh, P, um, so supervisor at the time, but you know, you get like. Some people don't realize like sometimes the effects they can have by being like uh, like by the comments they can make, especially people you look at, you look up to. And uh, some environment can be a bit toxic for that, like for that. And uh, so you can have like different reasons. So it's very important to identify the, the, this, this kind of thing. And again, talking about it is the best way to identify that. Because usually, uh, like you realize, it's not about like you're not the cause of the of this issue. You know, it comes from something else, and or and sometimes someone else. They can they it can, and um, so yeah, I would say that that would be my that would, that would be the best way I think to to deal with it. Uh, so I bring it back. So I was asking. So you mentioned earlier that about ten percent of PhD students actually end up in academia. Now, so it might be a bit difficult to answer, but I'm, I'm wondering if you think that there's anything common amongst that 10% that made them end up in academia? Like, is there a common trait or feature about them? I mean, to get one of these, so, I mean, you will, the 10% come from the fact that, you know, there are more PhD awarded than positions. You know, like at some point, mm. there is a mathematical rule, you know, about, mm. about it. <clears throat> Does it mean we should think a bit differently about what a PhD is? You know, should we, should there be like alternative degrees? I don't like, because <clears throat> also it's, um, I mean, you need a lab, you need students, you know, like, so this kind of pyramidal thing, it's kind of unavoidable. I mean, in the way it works at the moment, you have some researcher, you have a lab, 
with a few students, PhD postdocs, you know, under them. And that means that necessarily like it's, yeah, it has this shape. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, definitely might be something, it's just something also to, uh, to be conscious about and thinking like, you know, is my PhD going to only allow me to have a job in academia or can I also switch uh, to, to another sector? And, um, <clears throat> and a lot of like, especially in engineering, for example, it's very, it's kind of easy, even like thought, it's a thought after uh, to, um, to have a, like for a, to a PhD student, like people with PhDs might be harder in other, in other fields. So just something to be conscious of. So what's common between, but let's say, so what's common between these people who are, who are the 10 persons? So first, they're really motivated about academia. They don't mind like all these crazy things I was mentioning earlier, uh, not caring about, I mean, not, my, not caring too much about being criticized understanding that you know like uh, uh, yeah you will uh being a bit idealistic probably about about it is uh, is important i know people who's uh, like uh, who've left academia for for the private sector it was like best decision of my life i feel i'm finally valued for what i do i get some cool uh, some feedbacks but yes but you lose freedom in what you want to work on you know like so it's it's a trade off uh so for the ten person, at least you know they keep on going with the. They're, they're for, they're for them, these values, that these things you find in academia are what matter. Um, they have good. Uh, um, they have a good publication record. You need to publish. It's my uh, first put, like uh, postdoc supervisor at at uh, Monash, Melody Maguire, who told me once you stop being a researcher or a scientist the way you stop publishing, because you can do the best research in the world. If it's if you don't put it out, like for the for other people for others, it's useless. And she she was right about that. And uh, and that's how you evaluate it often. Is how much papers do you have? Good papers, and uh, yeah. And then you have and then you have a luck factor. At some point, you need uh, you need the right position to open up at the right moment for you, you know, like uh, with the, when they're looking for your set of skill, they're looking for someone with your level of experience. And hopefully there won't be someone, another applicant that will fit the job better than you. You know, like, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's kind of uh, like, so, so there is definitely this luck factor too. And uh, yeah. I would say like that's it. So if you and you like this flexi, like again, I mentioned this flexibility about being uh, accepting to do a postdoc somewhere, somewhere else until this position opens up. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably a bit of all that, you know. I mean, if you have a paper in science, in science during your PhD, it's probably gonna help a little bit too, I guess. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's not really, it's, it's not it's not too common. Sure. Uh, yeah, so you talked about uh, the need to be able to withstand criticism. And I think academia has been described to us as a place where ideas go through like, a lot of battles, right? They're going through a battlefield. But do, do you think that gets in the way of uh, exploring ideas and new ideas that are sort of a bit out of the box? Like, do you think it, it cuts them down too early? And have you had any experience with that or know of any stories like that? No, not, not too much. I mean, yes and no. It's uh, it's going to be. I'm gonna say. Yeah, I mean, if you, it's, a, it's. I would, for me, I would really encourage people to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Uh, I mean, and in academia, is actually you can more in academia than many of the fields because you are not driven by like making profits, which means you can take some chance. They may like take some chance, take some risk, and explore and try this kind of thing. And usually, I mean, it depends, but you will have reviews of people, you know, who are not going to be open to that and won't understand it. But usually people will. But if it's not bulletproof, they will poke hole in your, in your out of the box ID. So it's not going, but it's not because it's out of the box. I mean, the fact that it's out of the box makes, makes it probably makes it harder to get it bulletproof because it's something new, you know, and, uh, and it's going to be a chair and you some, uh, sometimes you can't like 
like, yeah, like figure out everything at once. And that's why you have this process. But it's not going to prevent from getting it uh, out, not like uh, for, for getting the idea out, if it's a good idea. Definitely not. Sure. Sure. Our next question is more about your own motivations as a scientist. Uh, so we, we, we're curious to know if, uh, if you pursue science more from a place of, say, like wanting to improve some aspect of society, right? More about like your know, large picture thinking, or is your uh, drive for science more, uh, is it more driven by just personal interests in the topic that you're studying? Like what, what, what motivates you, do you think, between the two? <clears throat> I mean, it's really a mix. For me, it's a, it's a mix of all that, honestly. Like, it's, um, there is definitely like this kind of selfish component, let's say. I mean, it's not selfish, but, you know, like, I mean, more personal asp aspiration of, I like, you know, I value uh, like free thinking and that's really a field that allows me to do that, you know, like, uh, and few other fields, feel like than academia, I mean, not field, but like just a working environment like academia, I mean, allow you to really think about things, be creative, question like, and for the set, like understanding the world for, and for also for the state, for the sake of understanding the world. And that's, that, that's definitely, that's definitely a, a big one. And, but also, yeah. And you can contribute. I mean, there was also this um, this will to contribute, you know, to the to uh, to the world. And you can do that in many different ways. You know, like you can you can contribute by uh, being a, like a social worker, by working like being a, becoming a park ranger. You know, if you stay in the natural science, or I mean, or even like you can and you can contribute like sometimes by creating some employment. You know, like I mean, depending on what your system of thoughts is but for me <clears throat> i like i like i just because i like to think about things and try to understand how the world works and i think that if we want to have a good life like i mean as a society have a good society we need to understand how the world works and how we interact with it works and how we interact with it and uh, and there's uh, this relationship uh, this uh, we, we will have and um, there are different ways to contribute to that, and one of them is is the science. Is the science, you know? Then you have the whole philosophical part, on the, uh, which are like uh, which uh, which are, I think are the two sides of the say, of the coin. But uh, yeah, for me it was really yeah, it was quite that, you know, like and trying to think uh, about yeah what I can do to. That was my first, my really my my first motivation, and then now that I'm in that, I try to find things that I like and I'm good at because that's also how I can contribute the most. So I'm not saying I will see, I will ch change the world myself, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, but I don't know. I'm just trying to bring, yeah, to uh, to bring this little like brick to the wall and hopefully it helps for like the would the wall stands without my brick probably but you know like it also helps standing up so i would say that yeah that would be the the, the motivation it's really like it's really a mix of, a mix a mix of both mm. yes yeah, so it, it, um, it's sort of like how isaac newton also says it's standing on the shoulder of giants that's what science really is it's a pyramid of many humans working. <clears throat> yes, no, exactly. Like, I mean, you hear about these great people and you shouldn't compare yourself to them too much also, like about the same reasons we, uh, we discussed earlier. But you wouldn't get these, like, I, these great, like people, these great people wouldn't have had these great ideas without also all the... All, all this amount of knowledge. So it's not just standing on the shoulder of giants. It's also like this giant who actually stand on this big basis made of many, many little contributions. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like this kind of like hummingbirds fable, you know, like of I'm doing my part and uh, try to just try to do yours and people will have different levels, but everything counts, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. And sort of reaching towards the end of our questions. Um, we sort of think 
um, the project that we do could be used by, as you said, there are many more people in academia than the jobs, so there are thousands of people who would probably benefit from this. I was just wondering, what is your ad advice for someone exactly in this situation moving into the undergraduate science course? I mean, try to, yeah. My advice is find the, like, understand why you are, you, you are doing, you are doing that, you know, take some time, discuss with people, try to really find what motivates you. And, uh, do, try to do the these for the right reasons and you will you know usually you will you know it when you do something that feels you know it feels right everything you know it works to like it's you know it's what you you, you want to do you know it's not something you do because you have no other id take your, like take the time to really to try to fire to find uh, what's important to you because we're going back to this idea of this core reason of what you're doing things and that makes you basically wake up in the morning, you know? And for me, that's the main reason. Once you have, once you get, you have that, then it's kind of like, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, you know, like uh, you find a good place to a good university and all that. You try to find the good, the, and to perform as best as you can in that direction, you know? But is the, all that will be so much easier if you if you know why why you do it and yeah be, be creative you know like don't limit yourself try to understand like you need to understand what's possible and then in all that make your own make your own path you know try to combine things so that it works for it works for you and um like yeah it's and it's gonna work if you have the right motivation. I mean, of course, like we are, we're not all equal in uh, in life. We don't start from or no, we don't all start from uh, from from the same point. It's harder for 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 for, for some uh, than others. But uh, <clears throat> I think if you do that, and uh, it will it will uh, yeah, you you will you will live a good life basically. Uh, and as our as our last question. Uh, this is something that we're asking all of our scientists as we speak. So we're trying to put together a book of quotes. So, like, uh, so you just like a sentence of two of, of some wisdom. It can be about science, it can be about life in general. It's like whatever you like. So, like, do, do you have a sentence or two? It can be your own or something you've read. So just some words of wisdom that you'd like. I would get no, uh, like these, these, these are just the quotes that that I like. And sure, it's a, uh, it I mean. Yeah, you will you will know where it comes from. It's like nothing is true, everything is permitted. Hmm. And I really like this quote because okay, it's from a video game. Fine, it's originally from a book that, that <laughs> you find in the video game. So Alan Woods. It was taken by like, and it's also in a, like it was also um, quoted by Nietzsche by Nietzsche. So right. that's right. enough. But uh, <clears throat> I really like I really like this one because you know don't like yeah it's good for like it's good for life and science i think you know it's always question things you know like in scientific in science we we, we search for the truth but i probably never really like achieve it because every time like you you get to a point and you look at that you examine it critically and you move it forward and it's a never-ending process and for you say it's um from where, like where it goes, where you decide to take science and or some, some field or something from where it is, is completely up to you. So that's for that's how we apply these quotes to uh, to to the to, uh, to science. And I think it's also I mean I think it's also true in life in in general. You know, like it's um, it's something you know like not never yeah always always question things always like reassess yourself and uh and i think that's probably like a good like probably why i'm a scientist also i guess because that's uh, i think that's uh, that's something that uh, that i try to apply in life in, ge in general you know like always think about you know like create like yeah reassess things so that's why yeah nothing is true everything is permitted really sure <laughs> sure cool. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, oh, my it's pleasure. Thanks, guys. I mean, I think that's honestly that's a great 
initiative, like what you what you're doing. That was so that was that was like I was when I got your email, it was like, you know, at first you get like you get a lot of emails. You got this one, I was like, okay, and I reached out and I was like, oh, okay, that's good, that's quite cool. And uh, and you told me, you know, you got quite like more many many more responses than you were expecting. Uh, apparently, mm -hmm. I think yeah, that's that's actually super cool to see this motivation and it's very refreshing. And I think that's why everyone else like was also thinking, you know. And that's actually I, I don't know. That's uh, I like uh, I uh, I really enjoy like uh, when you when you liked it when you when you said you had a lot of responses because get uh that shows that shows me that i'm in the in a good field like you know in a good environment you know with people are uh, like willing to respond like that and uh and help and i think that's why one reason why I like uh like why i like science and guys like wish you very all the best with everything and um yeah feel free and yeah feel free to reach out even in the future if there's anything you know like uh if you have any more questions or anything like more than happy to uh discussing more or do stuff yeah i mean whatever sure thank you Great. thank you so much thank you very much